when you did you did a study right on a on a wide or a large majority of of individuals that's that signed up for the study yeah and what were the parameters of the study and how many people were involved so i don't remember exactly how many people uh were involved in total mm -hmm. but we we documented um tens of thousands of use events so this was conducted by a, a colleague of mine uh, dr kirsten smith mm -hmm. at johns hopkins university uh, she is um uh, her PhD is in more or less the social work, social sciences aspect of interacting with humans and understanding how they use substances and why they use substances, right? And so she designed what's called an EMA study or ecological momentary assessment. So mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a, a lot of words. EMA is much easier to say. Um, but what she was able to do was develop an app where people could, every time they were taking their um, Kratom product, they would log in, say how much they were using, say how they were feeling, saying what, what time of day it was. Um, so we were able to get thousands, tens of thousands of user events across a period of time. Uh, to see how that worked. And, you know, these people volunteered for the study. So these were people that really wanted to contribute knowledge um, and also probably want to help keep this product uh, available in the marketplace. We didn't have people that were, um, I, sh I shouldn't say we didn't have, we, we had some small percentages of people that were using it purely to try and get euphoric highs. But the majority of people that were using uh, Kratom were really trying to do it for the benefit, the, the you know, perceived benefit that it was giving them energy. Oh, really? The, stimu the stimulant effect. The stimulant effect. effect, elevating their mood and treating their pain. I mean, those were really the top motivators for why people use this um, and, and seem to use it responsibly. Mm -hmm. It seems to be beneficial to them. Um, what we don't understand is where the benefit um, starts to cross over into a harm and how much time that takes, how often someone uses. We know that tolerance in humans seems to develop. Uh, so in other words, over time, you need more to get the same effect. Right. Um, I mean, I've talked to most people that generally use uh, two to five grams of powdered material two to three times a day. Um, and I've gotten emails from people that are, consuming uh so two to five uh, grams a day uh, three times a day is maximum 15 grams a day i've gotten emails from people that are consuming 90 to 120 grams a day um to be able to get the benefits and those people and this is how much again i think it said 45, 45 milligrams, milligrams. <laughs> of leaf material in that so, so or extract material in that so it's, it's hard to say um, moderate amount it would be very moderate this would be more similar to that range of that two to five gram yeah. uh, level uh, according to their uh, mitragynin content it has 30 milligrams of mitragynin we see about um 20 20 milligrams in a gram of a leaf. So this isn't even really two, two, three grams of leaf material. Yeah. And I know one of the biggest problems with it is that it's highly addictive. Um, just like caffeine can be highly addictive. I know nicotine is really, really addictive. Right. Um, and everybody's different with how much they can handle with addictive substances. But um, me subjectively, like, that's I'm no more addicted to that than I am coffee mm -hmm. every day. And um, like, are there any studies or do we know, what do we know about like long-term effects of this, of people using it responsibly and not abusing it? Yeah. So the, we don't know anything clinically about okay. long-term effects and okay. that, and that's a big limitation with yeah. all of this work. We don't even know anything in animals on long-term effects. Um, it's difficult and expensive to do long-term studies in animals. Uh, and, and then at the end of the day, how translatable is that study that you just spent months of your life doing in an animal like a rat? How similar is that really to the human experience right. and what happens in humans? We know that our bodies, our human bodies metabolize kratom differently than 
do dogs, monkeys, mm -hmm. mice, and rats. So we already know that there's differences. Um, humans get a different exposure to the alkaloids when we give um, a tea product, say, to a rat versus a human in a clinical setting, we can measure their blood and we can see that the ratios of the alkaloids actually are different in those different species. And so it's not a directly translatable thing, but the animal studies still give us the best marker for what what we could predict will happen in humans, right? right. And, and gives us a good basis of where to start. So that's kind of you know what we what we know right now. And then, as I said, chronic use, the only thing we have to go by are what people self-report to us. And so if someone says, hey, I've been using um, two grams every day, uh, twice a day or three times a day for the last 10 years, and I've been very strict about limiting how much I use, I've never felt anything psychoactive, I've never felt... Um, you know, anything like I was taking a drug, but I got this benefit of focus, energy, yeah. and I got this other benefit of, hey, you know what? My my knee that's always bothered me doesn't seem to bother me as bad as it used to. Right. Right? And problem is when people start to use these products with with the intent of getting high or the intent of replacing their opioid that they were taking before to get that pain relief. And it works a while. It works for a while, what we understand. Again, nothing in the clinics, nothing controlled trials. But they seem, tend to work for quite some time, and then that tolerance starts to kick in. And when that tolerance kicks in, we don't know. Right. It could differ for everybody as well. Um, People can metabolize these things differently. We know that there's what we call slow metabolizers, normal, quote unquote, metabolizers, mm -hmm. and then rapid metabolizers. And so and we know that with, with all types of drugs. Um, and so people that are slow to metabolize drugs generally don't need as much dose because they can use a lower amount. It stays in their system longer. They are slow to get rid of it. They're slow to metabolize it. We call that a lightweight on yeah. the streets. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have your your ultra metabolizers that, you know, they 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 start to eliminate things much faster. Um, they need more of it more often to get that benefit. Then drugs themselves can actually induce that activity. So they can induce our metabolism to speed up. So these are many things we still don't know about uh, kratom in long-term use does it actually increase the liver's efficiency and metabolism so that you're depleting the alkaloids out of your out of your system faster you need to take more in order to get back up to those levels mm. um, and and just like with opioids I think and other drugs that create a tolerance um, situation, you know, you, you build a tolerance to one effect that you're trying to seek while you don't build tolerance to other effects. Like with opioids, you see tolerance to the pain um, control much faster than you see to the constipative or respiratory depressive effects. And as you have to increase the amount of opioid to still take care of the pain you're experiencing, you're getting closer and closer to having more constipation and closer to respiratory depressive effects. Mm. And one of the things about the kratom is it doesn't have the respiratory, this is what Hamilton Morse told me. He said that they, the kratom does not have the respiratory effects that opioids do. Like, yeah, it's it seems to be less um, respiratory depression. I wouldn't say that it doesn't have it at all. Okay. It, I think it depends again on the dose, right? It depends on how much right. someone's taking and if they're overindulging it could be the case. But interestingly enough, most of the poison control center data and emergency department data that's been generated or, or collected indicates that overexposure to kratom is actually more similar to a stimulant overdose where people get agitated, they have cardiovascular events, um, really? and they uh, can have seizures. And so these are all more associated with uh, stimulant 
type overdose, like cocaine overdose. Um, it also could be causing a, a phenomenon called serotonin syndrome, where you get too much serotonin in your body. That gives you the same type of effect. And we know that these kratom alkaloids interact with, as I said before, opioid serotonin and adrenergic receptors. Interesting. So you have all this stuff sort of going on at once that, that could be contributing to that. We also know that all three of those pathways are involved in pain control. I mean, we always think of opioids as being the the primary, um, you know, gold standard for treating severe pain. Um, but we do use uh, serotonin compounds that can modulate serotonin levels for chronic pain. So we use some tricyclic antidepressants like amitriptyline has been used um, to treat neuropathic pains. Mm -hmm. um, and then the adrenergic system has also been known to to be involved in in pain um, signaling pathways uh, in our in our brain in our brain stem and, uh, sorry spinal cord and mm -hmm. and how the the signals are communicated and so um, there's this there's this sort of triple whammy effect going on in terms of pain relief that uh, it, it's really fascinated and opened up new doors because we've never um, pharmaceutically thought to treat someone's pain through all three mechanisms at once. Mm. And Kratom seems to potentially be doing that. Coming back to the respiratory depression is really a fascinating story because there's one camp that says this is due to how the molecules are interacting with the opioid receptors and they don't, um, they don't recruit a certain protein called beta arrestin that is associated with some of the side effects like respiratory depression and constipation. Mm. That that theory, that sort of bias signaling theory has not really panned out to be solid definition. There's still a camp that believe in that and there's a camp of researchers that don't really believe in that. I tend to think that what's happening with Kratom and the way that it is having less respiratory depression is because it has all of this pharmacological activity in it. Mm. And we know that one of the serotonin receptors called the 5-HT1A receptor, very different from the 5-HT2 receptors where the psychedelics That's act. That's the psychedelic right? one, yeah. So 5-HT1A, actually activation of that receptor is known to decrease opioid-induced respiratory depression. And so I personally think it's probably this soup of pharmacology, this pharmacological shotgun mm -hmm. that's activating many different systems in our brain that's um, affecting the, the respiratory depression aspects of this. So you're not getting as much respiratory depression because you're activating other systems that are keeping that respiration center healthy and going. Right. Wow. Um, I gotta take a leak real quick. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be right back. 